Thank you, um, Elizabeth Ann, for the opportunity and indeed the audience to speak here today as part of the 300th anniversary celebrations of this important institution and indeed to participate in this year's Dublin Festival of History. And this September marks the 300th anniversary of not just the foundation of Dr. Stevens Hospital on the Lane of the Stone, but also of the South Sea Bubble, the infamous stock market crash that shook the city of London in 1720, whose ripples were felt far and wide, not least here in Dublin. My paper today, therefore, takes a look at themes that have unfortunately become commonplace in 21st century Ireland. Bubbles, financial crises, speculative investments and recessions, but does so very much in an 18th century context. There are also echoes of our present discontents in the ways in which contemporaries linked um, both the real fear of plague, thanks to a significant outbreak in Marseille in 1720, and its specialist language um, contagion, particularly to the transnational financial crises that broke out first in Paris and then in London in 1719-20. For instance, in a sermon preached at Christchurch Cathedral on a fast day um, proclaimed by the government against the plague, Bishop Henry Downs explicitly drew out the links between viral and financial infections. And we can see, you can see that in the extract on the slide here, and I don't want to dwell on this too much right now, um, but I think, I think it's interesting that we can see this um, kind of, the, these languages being linked at that time, um, and I think it's worth commenting on, not least because contagion, as economists understand it, helps us to understand how the ripple effects of the South Sea bubble came to be felt in Ireland. So, to the bubble. While the story of the South Sea bubble is a transnational, even global one, as with old stories, we have to start somewhere. And where better, though I'm now not sure after listening to David, than the deanery of St. Patrick's Cathedral on a cold October evening in 1720, where Jonathan Swift sat down to arrange his thoughts on the financial crash, which had just burst causing financial panic, not just in London, but also in Dublin and many places besides. It was the local context that immediately concerned Swift, specifically the impact of the London stock market crash on the um, Dublin banks, causing a short-lived run on the banks, what we would now call financial contagion. And Swift, while no friend of the bankers or the emerging Irish financial class, recognised that their misfortunes in 1720 were not all their own fault. So to quote from his poem, The Run on the Bankers, the multitude's capricious pranks are said to represent the seas breaking the bankers and the banks. And Swift moved on from the local to the general in his next poem on the subject, The Bubble, which was written in September 1720 and quickly became the defining literary response to what contemporaries recognised as, I suppose, one of the defining events of their age. And Swift's brand of satire, well known to many of you, was well suited to skewering the projectors, the profiteers and the speculators who had designed, implemented and invested in the South Sea Company's ambitious and arguably, definitely fraudulent scheme to magically make money and wipe out the British national debt while simultaneously creating a new class of moneyed investor. It should be pointed out that the South Sea debt was finally paid off in 2014, so wiping out didn't really work. Um, but what was the South Sea bubble, which had sparked these biting critiques from Swift? Put most simply, it was one of the earliest stock market crashes or financial crises, and the notion of a bubble, um, as we now understand it, largely dates from this period. As the graph on this slide shows, the share price of the South Sea Company rose dramatically over a very short period, essentially spring and summer 1720, before crashing down even faster, that very steep decline you can see on the right-hand side there, that even faster than it had risen, leading to significant losses for those investors who speculated on the company's shares during the period of rising prices. So if you bought high, if you bought high you were going to end up selling low. Why did this, why did, why they did this is related to the second meaning of the word bubble. In the 18th century, to bubble someone was to con or to trick them. 
and the South Sea Company's directors, in combination with a corrupt government, were reckoned to have carried off one of the great cons or tricks in financial history by encouraging investors to invest in a company with limited trading prospects or expertise or future planning. So they didn't have much skills. Let's see how they did this and why investors were persuaded that this was a good idea. Persuasion was undoubtedly their expertise. And to do this, we need to first understand that this period, the late 1600s, early 1700s, was the first, arguably the first age of globalization. Chartered trading companies, the East India Company, the Royal African Company, the Hudson's Bay Company, were beginning to achieve critical mass, becoming the first multinationals as they sought to monopolize trade in silks, spices, furs, and slaves. And this is where the South Sea Company came in. Founded in 1711, they hoped to take advantage of the declining um, Spanish empire in South America, the South Seas, and gain a monopoly interest on South American trade with Europe. Um, they'd grown out of a financial company, um, the Hollow Sword Blade Company, who'd begun making swords and moved into investing in land in Ireland after the William Ish forfeitures in the 1690s and turned eventually to banking before into global trade. Um, so it's a sort of company with many different iterations, um, reinventing itself continuously. And the South Sea Company itself had been chartered in 1711 in return for a huge loan to the government. Um, so they lent a huge amount of money to the government um, to pay for the war that David was just mentioning, the War of Spanish Succession. Um, and, in, and in return, got a charter and the monopoly contract and the Asiento after that war from the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 with the right to trade slaves to South America and to trade South American goods to Europe. Um, this, these prospects seemed good, though there were many problems in terms of capitalization, in terms of trading experience and so forth. And the company created a propaganda campaign promising great wealth and found and um, began to found significant numbers of shareholders. Um, but the company, as I suggested earlier, were not that experienced in trading, and its key figures were more at home in finance and lotteries than international trade. Despite this, I think it's crucial to point out that the South Sea Company did trade in slaves, and it's often sort of argued that they didn't, and that they had limited sort of slave experience, and this story has been somewhat sidelined in much of the historiography, and I think we need to stress that they were a slave trading company. I think that's particularly important um, in the way we think about them. Um, but by the late 17 teens, they were looking for other options, and they get involved in what becomes known as the South Sea Scheme. And they move, they become more exclusively a financial corporation. Um, and in the decade 1711 to 1720, 42 million pounds of the British national debt was transferred to the South Sea Company, a colossal sum, in return for a regular subsidy paid to the government out of trading profits from the company to, co to cover interest payments. So the government's creditors, people who had lent money to the government, became shareholders in the company um, and the company then lent money to the government. So it's a massive private privatization scheme and they're kind of potentially moving the government's debts off the state balance sheet. And that's important. In order for this debt conversion scheme to work, the company's share price needed to stay up. They needed to be able to pay good dividends. Um, and to keep that up, the company, um, again, used propaganda, used bribery, used government support, used insider trading, used um, support from the royal family, um, cabinet ministers, and a whole range of other strategies to keep their share price up. And I think um, all of these sort of elements kind of, along with a general sort of move of sort of financial euphoria spreading from the Mississippi um, scheme and the Mississippi bubble co contemporaneous in Paris in late 1719, created the conditions for speculative mania. Um, so the, these promises of a great dividend and artificially high share prices were used to attract speculators and investors who were, le were led to believe that much greater returns were possible on their money than from any other source. And that 
they could have ever have previously imagined. The London stock market really for the first time drew in significant amounts of foreign capital. And the transnational element is fascinating and is only now beginning to be fully appreciated. And what I want to do for the remainder of this paper is focus on why so many Irish investors sought to speculate in the South Sea shares and what was their impact. Um, and we can just get a sense of the numbers here, um, I think tells us something of the magnitude and we can see that in terms of certain nationality of investors outside English slash British investors, the Irish are third in the league table and I suspect these are underestimates, um, but gives some indication of the transnational phenomenon. So moving to the Irish investors, this satirical image produced as part of a hugely popular packet of playing cards and usually I'll be passing these around the audience. I can't do that today. And the aftermath of the crash gives one perspective on who these Irish men and women were who came to invest in the London markets. Um, and we can see here a cartoon about a Taig who had, or Taig who had sold potato lands to buy South Sea stock. Um, and it talks about sort of providing money for his family and so forth. And it's very sort of, there's an Irish brogue there. This suggests a sort of country bumpkins who are easily duped by the brokers and stock jobbers of Exchange Alley. But is this a fair representation of what we know about Irish investors from other sources? I would suggest perhaps not. What we do know is that they came from a variety of backgrounds in terms of religion, class and gender, as well as financial experience. Some were investing novices, while others, like Jane Bonnell, an Irish widow, resident in London for 20 years, were knowledgeable participants in the emerging stock market. My own research has attempted to move beyond abstract generalizations about impersonal markets to try and just understand what motivated individual investors and to try and read as much of their correspondence as possible to get a sense of their motivations. And in an era when the landed aristocracy held most of Ireland's wealth, it's not surprising that members of Ireland's noble families were amongst those drawn to the opportunities provided by the South Sea Company's debt conversion scheme. Notable amongst them were members of the Molesworth family from Swords, County Dublin, descendants of a Cromwellian grantee, so the 16th, 17th century immigrants that David mentioned, and Sir Robert Molesworth, the first Viscount, and his five sons depended on government offices in the military, diplomatic service and the revenue to supplement their landed income. Such positions depended on access to ministers and on their good graces. Something the querulous and often times controversial Sir Robert was not always very good at. The possibilities of a stock market windfall thus appealed to him and his sons as a solution to the family's financial problems. At least five members of the family purchased South Sea stock with varying degrees of success. In June 1720, his eldest son, Sir John, then British ambassador at Turin, had a paper fortune of £100,000 and was planning on employing the fashionable Italian architect Alessandro Galilei to build him a new palazzo. A friend advised him to sell his stock and realised these plans, telling him to be moderate in his desires. One wonders about the word moderate here. His younger brother Richard, a career officer in the British Army, was advised to continue in his speculations because of his more precarious personal fortune. Neither brother sold their stock and each suffered significant financial losses. Even if Richard did eventually recover to become a field marshal and the owner of a house on Dublin's grandest 18th century street, Henrietta Street, of which Melanie is very familiar. And their father, Sir Robert, was perhaps more deservingly unfortunate. He borrowed his initial capital of £2,000 from a female relation, hoping to profit sufficiently to both cheat, in his own words, some other buyer and make his fortune. This cunning plan proved fruitless. And the Molesworths, though a cosmopolitan and educated lot, as well as prolific investors, were not necessarily well versed in the risks inherent in investing in the stock market. Lord John Percival, a leading absentee landlord and a leader of the Irish interest at court, believed himself to be a savvy investor and was praising the virtues of the South Sea Company from the first floating of its debt conversion scheme in his letters to his Irish-based correspondents. Like other members of the London Irish community, Percival was an active investor, but unlike some of his compatriots, 
He was initially reluctant to act as an informal agent or broker for his friends and relations, explaining in an illuminating letter how the price of stocks was liable to go up as well as go down at a few hours notice, and it was therefore difficult to act upon his Dublin-based brother's behalf. This remoteness, and you can see that in the, um, in the letter quoted here, from the centre of the trading action in London, certainly disadvantaged investors from Ireland. And it's no coincidence that they suffered, along with the Scots, disproportionately greater financial losses. Those on the ground in London still had to make intelligent decisions. And here, Percival was no expert, as it turned out. And if the stock market offered opportunities for members of the Anglo-Irish elite to increase their fortune, it also opens up doors for members of groups traditionally on the margins of Irish society for varieties of reasons, including moneyed Irish Catholics, provided they could get over any scruples about theological teachings and usury. There was no legal barrier to investing in joint stock companies or even the British or Irish government debt. And amongst those who spotted a potential opportunity were the Brown family Viscounts Ken Mayer, um, driven particularly by the irrepressible um, London-based aunt of the third Viscount, Catherine de Cunha, whose wonderful letters are full of gossip about the fluctuating fortunes of various relations, as well as unsolicited advice. Um, and one of the Brown connections, Sir Thomas Butler of Kilcash, whose daughter married the third Viscount, was one of the most successful Irish speculators in the bubble. So an Irish Catholic fortune arising out of the bubble. And I think that's important in terms of the sort of diversity here. And Irish Catholics were not the only disenfranchised social or religious group to invest in the South Sea Company. Indeed, the largest single identifiable group of Irish investors were members of the city's Huguenot community, many of whom had settled in the city as French refugees escaping religious persecution in the 1680s. These capital-rich immigrants, including successful merchants and bankers, such as the Latouches, showed the value of foreign capital and ideas in sparking innovation in the domestic economy. And we can get some of the names here of some Dubliners investing in the bubble. And they're not typical Dublin names, Cyrus Braggard, for instance. And, and again, that city of immigrants idea that David was mentioning, I think important. And the scale of investment in the South Sea Company and the capacity of the company's promoters to attract novice shareholders, many of whom had no previous experience, and therefore the risks inherent in all investment opportunities, has led many people to describe it as one of the great speculative bubbles. And I think that's certainly true. And we can see that not everybody was sort of brought into it. There were many serious people um, who understood this. And we can see this in the correspondence of members of the Irish elite, like the Broderick family, quoted here, talking about the South Sea frenzy, worrying about when the cloud will burst. And of course, the cloud did burst, and burst in late autumn, um, 1720. And we get some sense of that in the quotations here from the Moldsworth correspondence particularly, um, and they're failing to understand it. It was unexpected. Knavery was triumphant everywhere. Um, so again, I think that's significant. Um, and the crash, um, the crash in London was, I suppose, a product of loss of confidence and the collapse um, brought ruin elsewhere. So we come back to Dublin. And on October 1720, as the South Sea crash began, came down, we get the foreign exchange rates between Ireland and England reached their most favourable point for several years, sort of premonition of Brexit. Well, there was a short-lived run on the Dublin banks. Crisis was averted thanks to the personal intervention of Ireland's richest man, Speaker William Connolly, who employed his personal credit to shore up the local banks, a one-man bailout. That one man could solve a banking crisis says something about the enormous wealth that he had, but also the small-scale nature of Ireland's nascent financial sector. And this short-lived run on the banks was not the only ripple effect. Foreign trade collapsed leading to falling tax revenues. Well, the economic fallout in rising industrial centres in England led to reduced demand for Irish linens. Contemporary observers pointed out to all these crises, and we get a sense of this in newspaper reports in 1720, 1721, and I think that's significant. And we get a recession in Dublin. Um, and this impacted on the Dublin poor. Their plight 
was seen as so severe that fundraising benefits were organized to raise money to feed and, and clothe the poor. Chief amongst them was a benefit performance of Hamlet, which featured a specially written prologue by, yes, that man, the ever-present Jonathan Swift. Um, and we can see a sense of the miseries of this town being truly deplorable in the correspondence of Bishop of Derry here. And the collapse of the South Sea bubble had further consequences for the Irish economy beyond a short-term urban recession and a fall off in rural rental incomes. The greatest of these was the revitalization of older suspicions about financial schemes and public credit and banks. The most significant casualty here was a proposal for a national bank along the lines of the Bank of England or the Bank of Scotland, founded a generation earlier in the 1690s. Plans for an Irish bank rose and fall with the South Sea Company, beginning in 1720, ending in 1721. And reading the public debates about the bank, one of the things that immediately strikes the reader is the role of the South Sea bubble in framing the debate. And I think this quotation um, sort of graphically and somewhat, um, not the most nicest quotation perhaps, I think tells us something about that spread there, this pernicious bank, um, a bastard by law, John Law, got by one Mississippi on the body of a South Sea whore. And it's certainly graphic. But we can see some of the other quotations, some of the other pamphlets here. Um, and by the following autumn, this plan had faltered. Um, those in favour of the bank stressed why their project was much safer and very different in character. But their opponents were more colourful and effective, if less accurate. Um, such emotive descriptions helped to defeat the bank proposals, and Ireland remained without a national bank until the founding of the Bank of Ireland in 1783, something that arguably retarded Ireland's economic development in the long run. So, to conclude, the South Sea bubble was a great financial crisis, and importantly one that was felt beyond the confines of the City of London. I've tried to capture how it impacted on individual pockets, as well as on the development of the Irish economy. We've seen how Ireland has always been connected to wider world events, ones that in this case involved the South American slave trade, the emergence of modern financial markets, and the shaping of a literary critique of public finance, and what some might say as the excesses of the stock market. Thank you.